Okay, today we're going to be learning Pesachim Daf Yutet. Um, we're continuing along in our Tumantara. Okay, moving moving along. Um, we have one more page after this and a little bit more into Shabbos' Daf, but for the most part, we're, uh, we're getting to the end of this and starting the second parak soon. Uh, as I said, on, the, on Shabbat, we'll start the second parak. So we have two more days to get through, and, and then we'll be back to Pesachim. Um, today's daf is dedicated by Neil Green in honor of Sabina. You're an inspiration in your leadership of our Temple Education Com- Committee and in teaching of children in the school. You live the Torah you teach. I'm so grateful that you're learning daf Yomi with Hadran with me. Okay. Um, I want to just remind everybody what I mentioned yesterday, that we're starting our big campaign for Circle of Friends for 2021. So if you listen and you want to and you want to help contribute to support Hadran, please do so. Details are on our website really important to be able to allow us to continue both to continue our daily shirim and to be able to expand what we can do. Um, Okay, now we're going to start with uh, about 10 lines from the bottom of yesterday's stuff. Just a quick review. We talked about Tumat Mashkin. Our whole debate was liquids. Can they, on a Doraita level, we were discussing, can they pass on impurity or do they just become impure? But they don't pass on impurity or even maybe there was one opinion that said they don't even become impure on a Torah level even though that was a difficult opinion to accept. Then we said, Rabbi Yossi we were dealing with, who said, well, they can pass on impurity, but not to vessels, only to, um, to foods. Okay, and only foods, not drinks. Remember, foods to drinks and drinks to foods, but not, right? And you can't do one to the same. Again, on a Torah level, on a rabbinic level, they do pass down. And then we said that the whole proof of Rabbi Yossi, the fact that we can pass on tuma from a liquid to something else is all based on this drasha yitma it becomes tame it becomes impure which can be read as yitame it can pass on impurity because in hebrew those words are one and the same now that is basically like rabbi akiva his rabbi we said because rabbi akiva his rabbi had a unique opinion where he darshan yitma as yitame but he used it to teach something else a strange halacha that we said because nobody else said this until him, which is that chulin can become a shlishi. Remember, usually we say it ends at sheni in chulin and only truma and sacrificial items can become shlishi and sacri- only sacrificial items can become revi'i. He said that chulin can become a shlishi. So now we're going to start with this line um, at the bottom of Yudchet Amubet, as I said, about 10 lines from the bottom. Amar le Ravina le Ravashi. Ravina says to Ravashi, there's something I don't understand with what you said. You said that Rabbi Yossi holds like Rabbi Akiva, his rabbi. But, Hama Rava, but didn't Rava say, Lo Rabbi Yossi, Sava la Rabbi Akiva, Velo Rabbi Akiva, Sava la Rabbi Yossi. But wait, Rava said very clearly, Rabbi Yossi doesn't hold like Rabbi Akiva, and Rabbi Akiva doesn't hold like Rabbi Yossi. Now, that's a separate thing. That's not really connected to our pro- a point. Our point is that Rabbi Yossi doesn't hold like Rabbi Akiva. But in addition, you haven't mentioned Rabbi Akiva also won't hold like Rabbi Yossi. So Amrla Rebbe, so before we even understand why he said this, which we'll get into soon, we're going to say, here's the answer. Rabbi Yossi, v'shitat Rabbi Akiva, Rabbo Amaha, v'lelo svirale. Rabbi Yossi, when he said that mashkim, are tmei, are mitam'im, other, other foods, on a Doraita level, he actually wasn't talking according to his own opinion. He was quoting his rabbi, but he in fact doesn't agree with it. This happens very often. We've seen this many times where when they're stuck and something doesn't match up, they say, oh, maybe he was quoting someone else and we have proof to say Rabbi Kiva was his rabbi and Rabbi Kiva would hold that way. So it makes perfect sense because Rabbi Kiva holds yitma as yitame. He would obviously hold it also in our case. And therefore, that would make perfect sense. that He said it in the name of his rabbi, but he actually in fact doesn't hold that way. So now we want to understand what Rava said. So, Amar le Rav Ashi le Rav Kahana. So we've already resolved that issue, but we want to understand where did Rava come from. And it's going to be in the structure of a Bishlama. Bishlama means, basically someone said two things, or sometimes it's more than two things, and they say, well, one or two or three or four or five of the things you said makes a lot of sense, but one of them doesn't. So here we have, and almost always a Bishlama has an answer. We're going to explain how that also looks like it doesn't make sense, but it actually does make sense. So Bishlama Rabbi Yossi. The Bishlama structure is set up as such that first they say what makes sense and what works out, and they explain why. And then they say, but this doesn't make sense. And then they'll try to explain why it does make sense. 
So Bishlam Rabbi Kiva lo sever, Rabbi Yossi lo sever like Rabbi Kiva. I understand why Rabbi Yossi doesn't hold like Rabbi Kiva. Now I want to preface what we're about to read by saying it's a we're going to bring a Kav Chomer. It's a tough Kav Chomer to understand. Okay, so in other words, even though he says Bishlam, it's obvious to me, and this seems very clear. We're going to see it's a little bit of a tough source to to understand properly. Okay, so I'll just preface it with that so that when you say what. Don't worry, you're not alone, okay? A lot of people have trouble understanding exactly how this Kavachama works because they're comparing, Kavachama is usually based on, we're comparing this to this, and this and this are usually kind of similar. Here we're taking two things that are quite different and not so easily comparable, but they're comparable from like a, from a very particular perspective. And that's what you have to live with. That's just the way it is and say, okay, we're moving on. Don't ask too many questions on it. So, I'm a Rabbi Yossi. Okay, Ditanya. How do we know Rabbi Yossi is not like Rabbi Akiva? Because Rabbi Yossi says the following, and this clearly can't work in with Rabbi Akiva's approach. Remember, Rabbi Akiva's approach is Shlishi goes all the way, right? Hulin has third degree impurity, okay? Which nobody else thinks of. I'm a Rabbi Yossi. Minayin le Rabbi Bakodeshu Pasu. How do you know? Okay, this, now, we take it for granted, but he's asking the question. How do we know that there's fourth degree impurity by Kodshim? This is like a good example where, okay, we learned this, it's obvious, but we don't know where it comes from. So he's going to give us a source. How do we know that there's fourth degree impurity by sacrificial items? Vidinhu, it's a Kalva Chomer. Okay, now the first thing you have to know before we start this Kalva Chomer is what is a Mechusal Kippurim? Mechusal Kippurim literally means you're lacking atonement. What does this mean? You're a person who is in a situation where you have to be impure for seven days, like a Mitzora, a leprous person, or a Zav, or a Zava, or one of these people, that you have a period of seven days where you wait. Then, and sometimes you do things within those seven days, depending on what it is. Anyway, then you finish your seven days. What do you do? The morning of the seventh day, you already go to the mikvah, because in all Tumah except for a, a Nida, okay, a woman who's menstruating, or a Yoleda, which is learned out from Nida, they go at night. Everybody else goes in the morning. So the Zav, Zava, Mitzorah, all those people will go to the mikvah in the morning. They have to wait till the sun sets before they can become pure. That all came from the Shasha Konim Nechnesim Lechob Tchumatan, right? When the, with the first Mishnah in, in the Shas, right? In Brachot, when do the Konim, when do we say Kriyachma? From the time that the Konim can eat their Truma. That's after the three stars come out at night. So you have to wait till the nightfall until you become pure. That whole day, you're called a Tvul Yom. That's not what we're talking about right now, but we're going to make reference to it later, so I'll just remind you. A Tvul Yom has a certain level of impurity because he's gone to the mikvah or she's gone to the mikvah, but they have, they're still waiting for a final stage. So they're at this in-between stage, and they have a status like a Shani. Okay? That means they're not exactly a Shani Latuma, but they have a capability of passing on Tuma like a Shani, so they'll mess up Truma, and they'll pass on impurity to sacrificial meat. What's a mechusar kipurim? Well, after nightfall, what happens? These people also have to bring sacrifices on the day of the eighth day. Okay, so now the night comes in. They can't yet bring sacrifices because it's nighttime and you don't bring sacrifices in the temple at night. But, so you have to wait for the morning. So you're still missing something. You're not fully done with your process. You still have to bring a sacrifice. That's called a mechusar kipurim. Mechusar kipurim, okay, like I said, a tful yom is a status like a sheni. A mechusar kippurim has a status like a shlishi, okay? And he can mess up, um, he can eat truma, he doesn't mess up truma, okay? Because that's what we said, at nightfall you can already eat truma. But he's not allowed to eat kudshim yet until he brings his sacrifice. That's what allows he or she to now come into the mikdash and bring your sacrifices. So you bring your sacrifices and then only after that are you able to come in contact with sacrificial meat and other sacrificial items. So that's how, how our Kavah Chomer is going to start. Uma mechusar kipurim, shemutar b'truma, pasul b'kodesh. Okay, they are allowed to eat truma, but they can't eat kodesh. And if they do, they, they mess it up. Okay, if I'm a mechusar kipurim, I'm on the morning, I haven't yet gone to the mikvah, and I touch something, something sacrificial meat, I mess it up. I make it a ravi. Okay, we'll see in a minute why we're assuming it's a ravi, but we'll get to that in a minute. So I can mess up kodeshim. So shlishi she pasul b'truma, ain't no din she has to b'kodesh. Likewise, a shlishi itself. Now this is why the comparison is strange. We're comparing a human being who was tame, who's getting out of the truma process, to the truma itself, which when it is a status of a shlishi, and it can't mess up other truma. In other words, we're now assuming 
that shlishi is less pro- is um is right. Sorry, this is disqualified truma. The mechusar kipurim is in a better situation because the mechusar kipurim is allowed to eat truma and can touch truma. Now, here we're talking about shlishi that already became tamei, something that's impure, third degree impurity, which is no good for truma. Now, again, I said it's not a great comparison, so let's just leave it aside. But we have something that works with truma, which is a mechusar kipurim, something that doesn't work with truma, which is a third degree impure item, which, which was truma that's messed up. That, if the Mechusar Kippurim, who's in a better situation, can pass on impurity to a fourth degree Toma, to a Kodshim, that's fourth, right, create fourth degree Toma, then, or again, you wouldn't really call it yet fourth degree Toma, but since he can pass on impurity to Kodshim, then therefore Shlishi, that disqualified Truma, shouldn't it be able to... Third degree impurity should be able to pass on to fourth degree. So we're basically going to say, since a mechusar kipurim can eat truma but can't eat kachim, and therefore is in a better situation than this third degree impure truma which can't be eaten, okay, again, assume they're com- comparable. And if the first one can mess up sacrificial stuff, then the second thing, the truma, should also mess up sacrificial items. That's the kavachom. Now, that teaches us that there's Rivi Bakochim. The question is, where do you even learn that there's Shlishi Bakochim? Okay, you, you kind of need that before you get to that. So they're going to say, oh, Shlishi, Lamanu Shlishi Bakochim Mena Torah, Urevi'i Mikava Chomer. Okay, so what they're going to basically say is, if we didn't have a Pasuk to learn Shlishi, we might have thought that this Kava Chomer will teach us that there's an extra level of by sacrificial meat, which is Shlishi. Maybe it's what do we have? Dayola Voman Adin Liok and Idon. If we're learning out from Truma, and Truma only goes to third degree, so maybe this Kavachomer should only go to third degree. Maybe it only teaches third degree by Kochim. So what they're going to say is no. Third degree by Kochim, we already learned from a Pasuk, which means that when we have this Kavachomer, it must be teaching us something additional. It must be then teaching us the next level. Okay, so the order of this is a little strange. You would have thought they'd start with first we learn Shlishi from the Pasuk. Then, once we have that, and then we have a Kavachomer, the Kavachomer must be teaching an additional stage, which is the Revi. Okay, those are assumptions you have to accept here about how they're learning this out. So now they say, Shlishim in a Torah, where do we learn that from? Because it says, Habasar asher yiga b'chol tamei lo ye'echel. This is a verse specifically by Kodshim. It's in Vayikra Pasuk Zayin, uh, Parag Zayin, in the middle of all the Korbanot. It's talking about all the sacrifices in the beginning of Vayikra. And it says there, any meat that touches... Kol tame lo yachel. Now, kol tame, they assume. Mi lo askinan dinaga b'sheni. We're assuming what is this tame item that the meat touched. Now, I don't. It's not clear that you have to make this assumption, but Rabbi Yos is making this assumption that it's a sheni. Okay, meaning it touched something that's tame. What's something that's tame? It's something that was in a utensil that became tame from something else. So again, you have a sheret goes into a kli. This is the puzzle we saw yesterday about the sheret goes into a kli and then there's food in the kli. That's a sheni. So they're assuming when it says the meat touches any tame, it's talking about the meat touches the sheni. From that verse, again, the way he's reading it anyway, you can assume that we're talking about shlishi, that kudshim can become a shlishi. Again, once you establish kudshim can become a shlishi, then the kavachomer will teach you revi. Now, what does this have to do? We were trying to say, this is Rabbi Yossi, and clearly Rabbi Yossi doesn't hold like Rabbi Akiva. Why? Okay, so now, so now we're going to say, um, Sorry, this is just the end. And then they're repeating. So the Shlishi, Mina Pasuk, the Revi'i, Mikava Chomer. Now here comes our proof. The Isa Kadata, Savar Rabbi Akiva. Now, if he thought like Rabbi Akiva, that there's a Shlishi by Chulin, then let's go backwards. If the Shlishi by Chulin, you don't need a special verse to teach you Shlishi by Kachin. Which means the Pasuk by Kodshim that we just quoted would be teaching you Revi'i. The Kavachomer would be teaching you Chamishi. Which means that he wouldn't say, now look what he says here. Nitnei nami Revi'i b'chuma v'chamishi b'kodesh. Right? If he held like Rabbi Akiva, it should say here that we learn from the verse Revi'i. Because we're always going to have to have something. This is going to have to be additional to what we already know about Chulin. So therefore, according to Rabbi Akiva, if Rabbi Yo- and as first we're going to say Rabbi Yossi must not hold like Rabbi Akiva because he would have said we're going to learn Revi from the Pasuk and Chamishi from the Kavachomer and he doesn't say that so he obviously doesn't hold like Rabbi Akiva okay now by the way someone asked yesterday um, I think it was Shoshana who asked me does anyone agree with 
Rabbi Akiva about this. So first of all, it's not clear that anyone agrees, and I think the Gemara is going out, like Rav is going out of his way to tell you, not even Rabbi Yossi, a student, agreed with him about this crazy shita about chulin, right? So I think maybe they're trying to tell you, no, people didn't agree with him. Now, Ella Rabbi Yossi, so that we understand. So the whole thing was, we were trying to take Rav's statement, which we've already answered the question against Rav, which basically we said when Rabbi Yossi said the mashkim and all that, that's only Rabbi Akiva's approach, it's not his own. But now we're going to say, now we want to deal with Rabbi himself. He said, Rabbi Yossi doesn't know like Rabbi Akiva, and Rabbi Akiva doesn't know like Rabbi Yossi. So Rabbi Yossi doesn't know like Rabbi Akiva, we see, because we saw that right here. How do we know that Rabbi Akiva doesn't hold like Rabbi Yossi? I want to just make it very clear. If you put Rabbi Akiva and Rabbi Yossi together, then you're basically going to get to Ravii Bitruma and Chamishi Bekodshim, right? And basically, even though the Gemara is maybe suggesting that Rabbi Akiva holds that way, we're basically going to say there's no way Rabbi Akiva holds that way, okay? If, and that's the premise of this next section, if Rabbi Akiva held like Rabbi Yossi, in what way? In this whole thing. If he holds, we're going to learn one thing from a verse, and the next from a Kava, right? One degree more from a verse, and one degree more from the Kava Chomer. Then, if Rabbi Akiva held that, Rabbi Akiva would start, and Rabbi Yossi didn't start with the Shlishi, but Rabbi Akiva's going to start with Shlishi because he thinks Hulin already becomes third degree, which means that when we have the verse, we're going to get to fourth degree, and when we have the Kava Chomer, we're going to get to fifth degree. So, how do we know that he doesn't? Maybe he does. So the Gemara gives an interesting answer, which they then really question, which just teaches us in general, we'll see, I'm kind of prefacing this and saying it before we see it inside, but teaches us in general about how they learn things in their day, okay? So you'll you'll hear about their, their approach. Here comes the question of the Bishlama. So that we understood, but this, where do you get this from? Okay, now, this was the question, okay, if you have to go all the way back. This was the question that, um, one second, Amrle is Bahama Rava, sorry, Amrle Rav Ashi the Rav Kahana. Okay, Rav Ashi asked Rav Kahana, I don't understand. So Rav Kahana answers him back and he says the following. He says, Delo lishtametana velini revi'i betruma v'chamishi v'kodesh v'neima revi'i kivahi. Because no one brought to the Beit Midrash any brayta that said, there's Ravi'i Batruma, and they write this fourth degree impurity by Truma, and this fifth degree impurity by sacrificial items, and then kind of said, well, who on earth would this be like? And then answered Rabbi Akiva. Okay, since that never happened. Now remember, how did Brito get around in those days? Orally. They weren't written down into the Mishnah. Many things got written into the Mishnah or the Tosefta. Anything else is called a Brito Chutz. It's outside, meaning it never got written down. Now, if it never got written down, so now what happens? Well, people knew them orally. So in the baby drafts, people were always saying, oh yeah, I learned this, I learned that, I learned that. So they say, we never heard any conversation about anybody saying that there's Ravi and Chamishi and then saying, and whose opinion is that? Oh, it must be Rabbi Akiva. Nobody ever says that. So it must be, it's not the case. Okay, now that's an interesting approach to say, never heard a bride to so it must not be true. But the Gemara says, Va'ana nahachi nekum benismoch? You want to rely on that to basically say Rabbi Akiva doesn't hold that way? In other words, there's a lot of lost bright toad out there. The fact that nobody brought it doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. Okay, it's like a, you know, a tree falls in a forest, right? Nobody here, does it not exist? The fact that nobody brought it, does that mean it doesn't exist? So nothing Rav Ashi, Vitema Rav Kahana. So what happened? So they didn't want to rely on that, but they went out, either Rav Ashi or Rav Kahana, right? They were the ones having the conversation. So now one of them left the conversation and said, I'm going to look into this. I want to research this and try to figure out. So they go, Ve'eshkach, and they found Haditznan, they found a Mishnah that says, Haklim tzarefet masha betocho lekodesh, avalo litchuma. This is not really connected to our topic, but except peripherally, and we're going to get a little bit off on a tangent about it. If you have a vessel, and in that vessel are a bunch of different items, and they're not touching each other, and you touch one of them, and you're impure, and you pass on impurity to one of them, Something on the other side of the utensil, which isn't touching this, is going to be impure. Okay? Now, but that, sorry, um, let, me, let me be very clear. That means only if it's sacrificial items in this vessel will my touching one affect the other. But if it's truma or not truma at all, right, then, and I touch something on one side of the utensil, and it's not touching something on the other side, and I'm not touching it, the, tr- the tumah doesn't pass. The impurity doesn't pass to the other right. So only in kochim is this the case. And then once they're talking about a difference between tumah and kochim, the Mishnah mentions, the haravi, bakodesh, pasul, 
Ba'ashlishi betruma. Remember, pasul means end game. That's it. It's disqualified and it doesn't pass on impurity anymore. So here it says very clearly. Now notice Rabbi Kiva is not mentioned here, but hold off on that. So now, Rivi Bakodesh Pasul, Vashlishi Betruma. So it says here, fourth degree impurity affects sacrificial items, but that's it. They don't pass on to a fifth. And third degree by Truma, not fourth. Okay, now. So, so far, this is just an opinion. But, Amar Rabbi Chiyabar Abba, Amar Rabbi Yochanan, Okay, so Rabbi Chiyabar Abba says in the name of Rabbi Yochanan, the Me'eduto Rabbi Akiva Nishne Mishnazo. This mission was stated by Rabbi Akiva. Okay, now, if it's stated by Rabbi Akiva, you can see, okay, again, we'll get to this in a minute, but obviously then Rabbi Akiva doesn't hold fourth degree for Truma and fifth degree for Kudshin because that's not what it says here. It clearly says the end game is three for Truma, four for Kudshin. And there we have it, that Rabbi Akiva clearly doesn't hold that. Now, how do we know that this is a Tosha Rabbi Akiva? We're still in the middle of Rabbi Yochanan before we get back to our issue. Ditznan, it says in another Mishnah, Hosif, it says Tanya in your Gemara, but it should be Tanan. Host, right, Tanya means we learn in a Braita. Tanan means we learn in a Mishnah. Hosif Rabbi Akiva, Hasolet, Vaktoret, Valvona, Vagchalim. He added to the following that if there's Solet in that bowl, or Ktoret, um, or Levona, or Gchalim, okay, where they're each like individual granules, okay, but the other Chiddush about them we're going to see in a minute, that all these things are really only Tamemi Jarabanan. Why is that? Because they're not actually food. Remember, Tumat Ochlin has to be something edible. These aren't edible. Now, it's true, Solet is fine flour. You can eat it, but you don't eat it as fine flour. You eat it only once it's a food. It's not edible like that. And all the other things, the Ketoret, the incense, the Levona, the frankincense, and the Chalim, the coals, all those are definitely not food, but yet they're used for sacrificial items, right? They're used on the altar. So all these things he added, She'im Nagai told me, do we get back to Tful Yom? The laws about seruf would be that if you touch part of them, you have a bowl full of ktoret, okay? The incense are all little particles. If you touch one of them, it affects all of them, even though obviously maybe it's touching the ones right near it, but they're not touching the ones all the way on the other side, and yet seruf works for this. So now, it says like that. If Rabbi Akiva added to this Mishnah, he obviously agrees with the Mishnah. So if he agrees with the Mishnah, right? If he didn't, he would have said so. So now we get back to our issue. What do you see here? Revi in Hanishi Lo. Shlishi in Revi Ilo. Right? What do you see here? That it's only Revi for sacrificial items, not Hanishi, and it's only Shlishi for Truma and not Revi. So from here you see, this was our proof. Rabbi Akiva doesn't hold like Rabbi Yossi. Because again, if he held like Rabbi Yossi and he thinks Yitma is, it makes other things Tame. And in addition, that was Rabbi Akiva, right? It passes on impurity. And then you add to that this Pasuk about the Shlishi and the Kavachomer about the Revi, according to Rabbi Akiva, he would say, no, Yitma comes to be Yitame, which means even Chulin there's Shlishi. If Chulin is Shlishi, the Pasuk will be by, by Kodshim, will add Revi, and the Kavachomer will add Chamishi. And that's how we know the Rabbi Kiva clearly doesn't hold like Rabbi Yossi. So basically, we don't end up, even though they thought maybe someone held that there's fourth degree impurity for Truma and fifth degree impurity for sacrificial items, we reject that option. Not true. Okay, now, just because we got off on this Mishnah, the Gemara is going to add one more thing. From here, the fact that Rabbi Kiva adds all these things like Torah, Levonag, Chalim, and Solet, which are only rabbinic in nature, and yet the laws of Tseruf apply to them, he's going to assume, and again, it's not 100% clear to me why we assume this, but just kind of let's accept it, that Tseruf must be Durabanan, okay? That the whole law that if I touch one, it's going to affect something on the other side, must be rabbinic in nature because the application of it is to rabbinic items that are only prohibited by rabbinic law. Therefore, they assume the laws of Tseruf are only by rabbinic law. Okay, again, I, I, I'm not sure 100% why because it, one could say, no, they're, they're right in nature. They just apply to rabbinic laws. I'm not sure 100% why they assume, but let's just leave that for right now. Upliga de Rabbi Hanin de Amar Tseruf de Oraita. By the way, this disagrees with Rabbi Hanin because Rabbi Hanin thinks that the laws of Tseruf, that the sacrificial items merge together and you touch one, you touch them all, it's as if you touch them all, is a law by Deoraita. And we're on Erev Hanukkah now, a nice connection. We read on Hanukkah every day from in the Torah, from the section of the Nevi'im, the gifts that the Nevi'im, the, the princes brought to the temple. And when they did the Hanukkah Mishkan, 
And that's why it's like the Chanukat uh, Beit HaMikdash on Hanukkah. That's why we read it. Shenema, what does it say there? Tells in detail, right? It re- repeats all the gifts that Nisim brought, the 12, the, 12, um, the 12 heads of tribes. And it says there, they each brought Kaf Achad Asara Zahav Meleak Toret. One spoonful full of Toret. Okay, Asara Zahav, was, that was the amount. And anyway, it was full of incense. Now, what does it say? Kaf achat. What did they learn from kaf achat? Hakatu v'sa'a koma shebekaf achat. It, because it says one spoon, it could have just said kaf. Kaf means one. So why does it say kaf? Right, like if you look at a recipe, okay? In, in English, you always write one teaspoon. In Hebrew, they sometimes write kaf melach or kaf, you know, just a spoon. It's just obvious you mean one. So they say koma shebekaf achat, meaning it comes to teach you Everything that's in the kaf, that's in the spoon, is one. Okay? So, that means that whatever's there is joined together, and we learn it from a do right to law, not from a Dorabana law. law. Tnan hatam. That's the end of this section. We finished with all the Tumat Mashkin, although we're going to mention Tumat Mashkin again here um, in another minute, but we're basically done with those four opinions, which maybe are even only two opinions, about whether there's Tumat Mashkin do right or not, whether it becomes tame, whether it passes on impurity and all that. Now, now we're going to mention another, why are we bringing this up? Because this is a mission, even though it doesn't say so. Here, they, they quote part of it, but it starts off with Rabbi Hanina, Skana Kohanim. And again, we're talking about this Rabbi Hanina, who was the Skana of the Kohanim. He's the best person to testify about things that happened in the temple, and he's going to testify in this mission about another thing. Okay, this is Right? This is all from Masechet Eduyo, which, by the way, many people say the whole Masechet Eduyo was taught on that day that they opened the doors of the Beit Midrash to Rabbi Lazar ben Azarian, you know, and when he opened the doors of the Beit Midrash to everybody, and it was all said on that day. Tnan hatam, amachat shenimtzeit bebasar, shasakin vayadayim tehorot, vabasar tameh, nimtzeit beperesh hakol tahor. Okay whole bunch of new things, and this is, again, one of those Gemaras where you're going to have to kind of suspend trying to understand it all entirely right away because the Gemara is going to go piece by piece and try to figure this out. So don't worry right now that you don't understand it and you don't know what it's talking about because even in the Gemara, they didn't really understand it. And they're going to try different options to try to connect um, to connect all these things and figure it out. He said that if there was a needle, okay, now again, we had yesterday the para drinking, the cow drank the, the mechatat waters, right? The purifying waters. This time we have a needle that was swallowed by an animal. And when you slaughter the animal, you find a needle inside. Now we're assuming right now that the needle is safek tame. We're not sure is the needle impure or not. I say right now because eventually we're going to reject that. Okay, this is why it's going to be a little confusing because they're going to make certain assumptions and then question those assumptions and then reject them and say it must be something else. They're going to have a little trouble trying to figure out what this case is. So you find a needle that you're not sure if it's impure or not. And it's found where? It's inside the meat of the animal when you slaughter it. Now, there's what's there? There's three items there. There's the meat of the animal. There's the hands of the shochet, of the slaughterer, and then there, or, or the kohen who's handling it. And then there's the knife itself. So comes Rabbi Hanin and he says, Hasakin v'hayadayim tehorot. The knife and the person's hands don't become tamay. Okay? But if you remember, we talked about yadayim can become shniot. Okay? Meaning... Sometimes if you touch something impure, right? The rabbis made a gzera. They said, if you touch something impure, now normally kalim don't make a person tame. Remember, that's just the way it goes down a level. People can only become tame from the actual tame item itself. But, or like a tame mate who was, right? He can also make someone tame. But only an avatuma. But once you're at a kli, the kli is not an avatuma. It could make, Right? It can't make a person tame unless it was an avatuma, which we'll get to later, that maybe it was an avatuma, but right now we're assuming it's not. If it's not an avatuma, it doesn't make a person tame at all. So, but it could, the rabbis instituted a an ordinance that if your hands touch something tame, then your hands can pass on tuma. Okay, it's different. That, like, you wouldn't need to go to a whole mikvah to, mess, to clean, right? You would wash your hands. Okay, that's a whole thing that we've seen a few times. But in this case, they said, oh, no, we're not going to say your hands are tamay, and we're not going to say the knife is tamay. Only the meat is tamay. 
However, we're going to, and this is not going to be so significant for what we're dealing with, but if it's Nimseper Perish, if it comes out in excrement of the animal, then Hakol Tahor, even the Macha, we're not going to say is Tahor, is Tame, okay, even the, sorry, even the meat is not going to be Tame in that case, because it came out in the excrement, it's like disgusting, it's not really worth, you know, anything. I'm a Rabbi Akiva. So now Rabbi Akiva says, what's the purpose of this? Rabbi Akiva says, this is the important line. Zachinu she'en tumat yadayim b'mikdash. Wow, what a schut we have. How great it is that there's no tumat yadayim b'mikdash. Okay? And he says this is a reaction to this Mishnah. This goes back to the Beit Mitbachaya, the Beit Midbachaya, where the rabbi said, oh, something rabbinic, we're not going to have it in the temple. Remember, right? We're not going to have all the liquids become to me. Likewise, he says, we're not going to have tumat yadayim in the mikdash. The rabbi said, yes, we have xera on tumat yadayim, which we're going to learn about in a minute. That's not relevant in the Mikdash because when the rabbis instituted that Chumrah, they said, well, we're not going to add more Chuma to the Mikdash, so it's not going to be relevant in the Mikdash. To which the Gemara asks, wait a minute, why didn't he say, now notice what he said, the knife is impure, is pure and the hands are pure, which means that there's two things that they weren't goes through in the Mikdash, not just one. V'nei she'ein tumat yadayim v'kelim Mikdash. You're, he's also pointing out that the knife isn't tame. Now, why would the knife be tame? A machat, a needle, shouldn't pass on impurity to a, a um, another utensil. Utensils don't pass on u- u- impurity to utensils, only to food and drink. Remember, a rishon can pass on only to food and drink. Like I told you, we're going to keep repeating these, so eventually you'll get it. So if that's the case, now, something important to understand here. At this point, they assume that there must be something else going on here because why would he tell us about the knife? Of course the knife isn't isn't tame. He must be talking about a case where there were liquids here and the liquids, remember what we learned about Zerat Mashkim? Besides regular liquids, now there's this extra thing which is if a liquid touches a utensil, it raises it up a level or if it touches food, right? It could be a liquid touches a cleave that's a rishon or a liquid touches food that's a shani. Doesn't matter what the liquid touches, the liquid kind of reignites the tuma. The, the liquid becomes a Rishon, and not only is it a Rishon, it's a much stronger Rishon. A Rishon can only pass on impurity to food and drink. This Rishon, the Gezerah of the rabbis, was that a mashke, a liquid, touches a Rishon or a Shani, it itself becomes a liquid, it, uh, a Rishon. It doesn't drop down a level, and it even might even go up a level. And not only that, it also can pass on impurity not just to food and drink, to make it a Shani, it can also make Kalim a Shani, vessels. So now they're assuming that what happened here, he's trying to say that whole Gzair of Mashkin doesn't apply by this Machat. There must have been some liquid there. And the liquid touched the needle and then touched the meat or the knife or the hands. Yes, it passed on impurity to the meat, but it didn't pass on impurity to the hands and to the, or you wouldn't need for the hands, but you would need for the Kalim. In order for the Kalim to become Tameh, you would need the Mashkin Gzair. So he says the fact that the kli is to hold the sakin, the knife, is not impure, must be because of there's no gzerat mashkin, that it's metame kalim, vessels, in the mikdash. So he says, you should have said that, then why did you just say there's no tumat yadayim? You should have said, she'en tumat yadayim v'kalim v'mikdash. So to answer that question, we have one possible answer which we're going to reject. Amar of Yehud Amarav, Yitamar of Yassi, Rabbi Chanina, yadayim kodim gzerat kalim nishnu. Uh, the gzera of Yadayim existed before the gzera of Mashkim and Kalim, of liquids touching vessels. And when this mission was stated, that wasn't in existence yet. It's a little bit difficult because time wise doesn't really work out. But anyway, let's just assume that that's the case. That this is before the gzera of Kalim, that it was said before, and that this was talking about before there was even gzera Kalim. So now, again, it's not really clear then, so why does he even tell us the knife is Tahor? Obviously it is if there's no gzera of Kalim. But putting that aside, they reject this answer for other reasons anyway. Um, Rava, what do you mean that Yadayim came before Gzera Kelim? By the way, some people attribute Yadayim to Shlomo Amalek, and that's why it makes sense to say that Yadayim came way before. Okay, but Rava says, no, because Vahat Shabayu Bobayom Gazru, Ditnan. If you remember, if you think these pages are hard, remember in Shabbat also around these, these number pages in Shabbat, we learned about the Yud Chek Zerot, and there were a lot of Dapim about. All this Tuman Tara, there was this one day where they went to the attic of Hanina, I forgot his last name, but we, they went to his attic and it was like when they go to the Knesset and you see like who's in the, you see today you're going to get a good vote, right? Because 
all the opposition isn't there and you basically pass the bill when nobody's there. Same thing. They saw there were more students at Beit Shammai that day and they voted and they voted in all these because they wrote, uh, most of them related to Tumen Tara. And that's what we got in Sechet Shabbat all into Dine Tumah Tara. Likewise, we're talking about them here. So he said, all that happened on the same day. If you remember, there was a whole debate. Did Hillel agree with them or not? And w- Anyway, that's a whole other thing. But they all happened on that day. Ditanan, as it says in the Mishnah there. Hasefer, hayadayim, hatful yom, ha'ochlim v'akelim shenit mu'bamashkin. So first of all, what's there? Sefer is books. Remember Sifrei Kodesh? If they were worried about the mice, they would keep the truma next to the Sifrei Kodesh because they were all sanctified and then the mice were getting in and eating the books. So they said, no books mess up, right? They're metame yadayim. If you touch the Sifrei Kodesh, your hands are tame. So then... If you, they're right nearby, you'll touch the truma. So therefore, they were trying to avoid truma being stored next to the books. Hayadaim, that's our gzera, yadaim. Tful yom, that's what we just discussed. The tful yom has some sort of tuma, even though they've already gone to the mikvah. Since they, it has not nightfall yet, they still pass on tuma in certain ways, in a weaker kind of way. And ha'ochlim v'kelim shenit mashkin. That's our gzera. So they all happen on the same day, so you can't give that answer. So el amarava. So he says, ah, tumat sakin. The reason is that in this case, it wouldn't even be a problem if it were chulin. Okay, so now they say, um, one second, right. Um, right, this is a different answer. Okay, he wants to say, why was, why did he not mention that there's, that there was, that the whole reason the knife is tahor we assumed it was because there's no Xerat Mashkin, but he says no. This not it's not that it's there like Zachinu in the temple that we don't have these things. This would even be a problem. This wouldn't even be a problem outside the temple, and that's why he didn't mention. Okay, so now what do you mean? What exactly would this right? Now why? Why would it not be Matame? Because hi Sakin Dinagabimai, what did it touch? Ilema dinagabe basal ha'in ocha matame kli. If it touched the meat that became impure from the needle. Well, of course, that's not going to be a problem because Ochel doesn't pass on impurity to Kalim. And if it touched the needle, it also wouldn't be. So basically, they say, from here you can see that it's not the reason Rabbi Akiva didn't mention it was because it wouldn't be Matame anyway. And now it sounds like we're assuming there was no liquid that came there. Okay? So now, if there's no liquid, well, then we're left with, so what was the issue at all? Okay, and why are they even mentioning this? If it wasn't even a problem in the temple, why would they even mention that in the temple it's going to be pure? So, hi, machab maya vidate. And in general, this case, okay, not just about the kli, but that it doesn't make the, the knife, it doesn't make the person, and it does make the meat. Like, what's going on here? What kind of suffix are we talking about? What's the issue? Until now, we started assuming it was a needle, that we're not sure if it was impure or not, and then it touched a liquid, and then the liquid came in contact with other things, but then we said that's not the case. Must be there was no liquid. So, what was the case? Inam a suffix machat, if you're going to say, like I said before, we're not sure if the machat was tame or not. But that doesn't make any sense. Because ha'itmar, Rabbi Elazar, Rabbi Yossi, Rabbi Chinin, it was said, the two of them say, Chadamar, and then we're going to get a little bit off on a tangent on what they say. Chadamar lo gazwa safek ha'rokin shebi Yerushalayim. The Chadamar lo gazwa safek ha'kelim shebi Yerushalayim. In Jerusalem, people were much more careful about laws of purity and impurity because they were near the temple. Therefore, Anyone who is a Zav, now a Zav or a Zavad, their saliva and liquids that come out of their body are impure. They carry high status impurity, like an Avatum. Therefore, in, if you see saliva on the ground or touching something, let's say you have saliva on your, on your bag, and you don't know, is that from a Zav or not? Well, if you're in Jerusalem, you don't have to worry about it. Likewise, you don't have to worry if you're not sure if you see a vessel and you want to know, is it Tameh or not? You don't have to worry about it in Jerusalem because people are very careful about things. So because of that, why would we be worried about a Safek Machad in Yerushalayim? All Safek Kalim wouldn't be a problem. We assume they're Tolim because people keep things betaha, right? They keep things very clean, you know, pure in the in Jerusalem. So Amarav Yudah Amarav, well, like I said, we're going to go off on a tangent and get back to that a little bit more. But right now, Let's go back to our issue. So it must not be that. It must be You had a needle that you knew was tame from a dead body. Came in contact with a dead body. And we're going to learn in a minute that what? Remember, it's metal. Comes in contact with a dead body. That's what we call halal cherev. Because it says halal cherev, it's not just the halal, the dead body, but also the cherev has the status of the dead body. So here, it takes on whatever status of what it touched. 
So if it touched the dead body, which it didn't, it would be avi avodah tumah, but this touched the tamei meit. So it's an avodah tumah, which is going to change the whole story. Till now, we thought we were talking about kli that was a rishon, which can't pass on impurity to other vessels and stuff, right? Because rishon does it. If you call it a re, uh, an avodah tumah, then it might. So let's talk about that. So what happened? You had a needle that was that was 100% impure. impure. Now, and it was an avatuma. The kirab basara. And when you open up this meat, you find the missing needle, right? This is you find something you've been you lost a long time ago, right? You find that missing needle, so you know it's tummy. Now, Rabbi Yosi, Rabbi Avadama. Okay, that's one answer. Okay, so that's one possibility, which we're gonna again explain a little better in a minute or two minutes. Rabbi Yosi, Rabbi Avadama, kigon shaita parach hasuma uba mikhutz liroshalim. Maybe the animal was muzzled. And it came from outside the city. Now, outside the city, we said, Safek Tuma inside the city is Tahor. But Safek Tuma outside the city is Tameh. You came muzzled, so it certainly didn't swallow the Machat in Jerusalem. And therefore, we can assume it happened outside Jerusalem. So two possibilities as to how we could have this case. So first, we're going to go more in depth into this Machloket about the suffix. Um, in Yerushalayim, um, Gufa. Rabbi Elazar, Rabbi Yosi, Rabbi Hanina, Chadamar lo gazru al safek halukin shibu shalayim, v'chadamar lo gazru al safek kelim shibu shalayim. Okay, that's just what they said. I won't repeat it again. Rokin tanina, kelim tanina. Now they say, why are these emoraim talking about something that Tanaim already said? Both these things appear in Tanaitic sources, so what are you teaching me? There's no point to tell me something if it's obvious, if we already know it from an earlier source. So here we're going to see where we saw these cases, and then we're going to explain what they were adding to this. Rokin Tanina, Ditnan. It says in a Mishnah, Kol HaRokim HaNimtzeim BiYerushalayim Tohorim Chutz Mishal Shuk HaElyon. This is very interesting historically. In the upper Shuk, that's where anyone who is a Zav would go shop there. They basically have one area. This is for you so that you don't mess up everybody else. Therefore, in the Shuk HaElyon, it's a problem. Anywhere else, it's not a problem. So, here you see, Safek Rok in Yerushalayim, as long as you're not in the Shuk HaElyon, is Tahor. So why do you add this? Lo Tzrich HaAfagav Di'it Chazik Zav. What it means is, let's say, it's true the Zavim were supposed to go there, but let's say I happen to be near a Zav, and then I see saliva. Do I have to worry? The point is, I don't. Any suffix in Yerushalayim, that's what the Emoraim were adding to what the, the Mishnah had said. Kelim Tanina, what about the Kelim? Ditnan, kol kelim anim tzim Yerushalayim, derech yirida lebeit ha-tvila tmein. Now, what's the assumption? Someone's on their way down to the Mikvah. There was a, clearly a path that went to the Mikvah and a path that went away from the Mikvah. So on the path to the Mikvah, if you find Kelim, you can assume they're Tmeim. Now, what does that seem to imply? Only on the way of the Mikvah, because we're assuming you were bringing them to Toval and you dropped it on the way. But Hada Alma Tolim, it sounds like everything else is going to be Tahor. So again, what did the Amoraim add to this? So they say, wait a minute. But you didn't read the rest of that source. If you're going to go by that logic, that it says anything on the way down is Tameh, that means everything else is Tahor. Look at the second part. Uh, sorry, derech, I read that wrong. Derech aliyah tehorim. On the way up from the mikvah, it's going to be pure, right? The path that leads away from the mikvah, we're obviously assuming it's going to be pure. So now, that seems to imply only on the path up, but anywhere else, had to alma tmeim. So they say, no, no, no. What? So therefore, since this can be explained in two different ways, what are the Amoraim coming to say? They're coming to teach you specifically this, that what? Resha Dafka, really take it from the Resha. On the way down there to Me'im, everywhere else it's Tahor, except for one exception, and that's what the Seifa is coming to teach you. Seifa Lav Dafka, Ula Fuke Gaziata. The Seifa is coming to tell you on the way up, you can assume they're Tahor, but if you find them in alleyways around, since people went through these alleyways to get to the mikvah, there you have to worry. But anywhere else in Jerusalem, you don't have to worry. Okay, so that's what we had the Chiddush of what those two people were saying. Okay, now. Now back to our issue. Ule Rav de Amar kigon she avdalo machat meimet the kira babasal. So that's the case now. We're now still trying to understand this case with the needle. The needle was in the animal. The needle had come in contact with its meimet. Then the needle touched the meat. That right now we're not sure what happened. So let's see. Then he right he opens the animal. They find the needle. Kevan de Amar Mar b'chalal cherev cherev hareu k'chalal because the Torah says chalal cherev. They learn cherev hareu k'chalal. This machad has the status of an av hatuma. If so, adam v'kelim nami litma. Well, if it's an av hatuma, then the knife and the hands should become tame. The whole person should become tame because he came in contact with an av hatuma. So now we don't understand. 
So Amar Avashi, and here he comes to explain why again. What happened in that case? We said the meat is impure, but the hands and the knife is not. Why is that? Has nothing to do with mashkin that we thought before. Now we're going to say what's the reason. Amar Avashi zot omeret azara reshut harabim hi. Vahava le suffik tumor bereshut harabim. Veko suffik tumor bereshut harabim sveikot tahor. This comes to teach you the whole reason. We're not sure. What are we not sure? We're not sure. Did the knife come in contact with it? Did your hand? Did anyone touch it? Did the knife touch it? Did you touch it? Did the, right? Did the meat touch it? So, safek tumor bereshit harabim, tahor. We're going to say it's tahor, other than the meat. Okay, we're going to have to deal with the meat tomorrow. But right now we're dealing with the hands and the kaven. These are the the knife and the hands. It's safek. Safek bereshit harabim, sveko tahor. Now. This all is learned out from the Sota, remember? Because she goes alone with a man and she's accused and she's called Nitme'ah. Is she impure or not? So we learn it from the Sota. Sota only happens Bereshit Echid. If she's Bereshit Rabim, there's no suffix about her, right? She goes with this one man and she's, right? And they're all in public. No one's worried about that they slept together in public. So now, they say, wait a minute. According to this, Ha Bereshit Echid Sveikotameh. You sound like if it were to happen. It, so number one, they're saying the Azara is a public place. Right, even though it's maybe closed in space, it's not considered Rashid Yachid because it's public. Tons of people come into the Azara. That's why it's public, that's why Sveko Tahol. But now you want to say, so if it were in a private space, it would be ta it would be Tame. So like let's say this wasn't in the temple, it was somewhere else. The needle was Tame Avatuma. It may be touched a Kli. You would say it's Tame? No way, you would not. Why? There's another element we learned from the Sota. It's very interesting. Hai Machatavarsha they say, wait a minute. What else is true about a sota? You can ask her, did you sleep with him or not? You can ask the man, did you sleep with her or not? Which, no, she might not answer you, but there's theoretically a way to find out. Therefore, only chuma that you can ask, like, did you walk on the path that had chuma there? Remember, we had the Shnei Shvilim. One walked on the Tame, one walked on the Torah. We don't know who did what. Now, it's true you don't know the answer, but theoretically we can ask you because you're human, right? And there's someone to ask. The case of a knife here, the, you can't ask the knife, did you touch the needle? The knife doesn't, won't answer you. So therefore, how could you assume then only because it's Rishad or Abim, it's Tahor, but if it were in Rishad it would be Tame. It wouldn't be Tame because it doesn't have Da'at Lishael. So the answer, the obvious question, which is what do you mean? How'd the knife get there? A person used the knife to slaughter the animal. The knife wasn't moving by itself. So therefore, Mishim Dahavi Safik Tuma Habadi De Adam. This is a Safik Tuma that became a Safik Tuma because there was a person involved. But Amar Rabbi Yochan, I will just finish this last line. Safik Tuma Habadi De Adam Nishalina La Filu B'Kliam Munachal Kabei Akarka Kedavar Sheish Bodat Lishael. Okay, well, we'll end here with this. I'll explain it better tomorrow. But basically, what we're saying is Safik Tuma. If there's a human behind it, right? And there's, then you can, right? You can ask the person, did your knife touch the needle? And that's why, again, now we're going to explain why when the needle touched the, the utensil, did it, the sakin, did it not become ta, tame? That's because it's safe to tarabim is tahor. Okay? And that's why we don't say that the knife is tahor because we view the, the beta mikdash as a rishut harabim. Okay. That's it for today. Have a good day.